Welcome to another episode of selfprinciple.org. This time, let's take a look at coffee and what is the risk of death surrounding it and what can we learn for our own everyday life. So first of all, let's talk about some fun and interesting things that I found really fascinating to learn about coffee. First thing is, is did you know that coffee was initially discovered in the 9th century by a goat herder called, you know, this is all hypothetical. There's not a lot of proof behind it. But basically, the, the story goes that all these goats would actually eat the coffee beans and they would then just stay up all night and run around with all this energy. So that's how it kind of came about and then people started finding out how to make coffee, sort of the drink out of it. Now, worldwide, 2.25 billion cups of coffee are consumed every single day. And it's no wonder that there's so much research that continues to come out on it. But what's fascinating is that if you wanted to simply save money, the average American spends about $1,100 per year on coffee. So think about that. 1100 compounded over 30 years could translate into a lot of money savings. And then what's really interesting is, is <laughs> there's a cream puff, which is the Guinness World Record holder for the oldest cat that lived, 38 years old, actually drank coffee every single morning. Now, this is correlation. This is certainly not causation, but it's just a fun fact. And then the world's most expensive coffee is six hundred dollars per pound and that's the kopi luwak and basically what happens is there's these asian palm chevettes who actually eat red coffee cherries and here's where it becomes really interesting now the coffee beans go through their body undigested and some brave soul has to go and collect them from their poop and that's how you get six hundred dollars a pound coffee all right so let's get started so this time we're looking at the really large trial looking at 10 European countries and what is the rate of mortality or the risk of death with higher amounts of coffee drinking. So what's the data? So first thing was that they basically wanted to look at what's going on with disease specific risk of death. So what are different diseases and all cause which means all types of causes associated with death and drinking coffee. Now this is a prospective study which means they start and they look forward in time which is very important because that makes the study stronger rather than retrospective which is looking back in time. 10 European countries, so keep in mind this may not apply to us the same way, it's looking at European countries. So if you're in California or the United States somewhere or in a very different geographic part of the world, let's say Southeast Asia, the same data may not apply because it's not looking at the same people. It is a very large trial, half a million people as part of the EPIC trial, which we've had great data come out of. This is the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition. And look at that amazing follow-up, 16.4 years. All right, so what were those 10 countries they were looking at? Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, and United Kingdom. Recruitment-wise, it was basically over the age of 35 years old. So all you guys in your 20s, once again, this may not apply, but because we have so much data on coffee, all the other data along with this covers a very large population. Now, every time you look at studies, you want to know who are the people they excluded. Well, in this case, they excluded people who were actually sick. So if they already had cancer, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, or highest or lowest uh, in terms of eating too many or too little calories, or they basically didn't follow up. So why should you care about exclusion criteria? Because that tells you a lot about the study. In this case, they're looking at mostly healthy people, not people who have diseases. So once again, it may not apply to those people who have diseases. In terms of data collection, always an issue with every type of prospective cohort studies or looking at population studies is self-administered questionnaires. So people will answer to try to please the person asking the questions or they may just not know the answer. Listen, it's hard enough for me to try to remember what I ate yesterday. And then caffeinated versus decaf. This is important because this was only collected in a few places. So Germany, Greece, Italy, Netherlands, UK, but not all 10 countries. And then coffee consumption was basically based on cups, right? So it wasn't like this is how many milliliters of coffee you're drinking and so forth. It's based on standard cup sizes. 
and then blood tests, which were very helpful for things like liver diseases and so forth, were only done on a subset of people. So even a smaller population had blood tests. And, and that makes sense because trying to get blood tests done on people, especially in a large study, is very, very difficult. Okay. So what did we know about the population? Once again, when you look at a study, you always want to look at both the treatment arm and the control arm and get an idea of what are the differences because that can cause a lot of biases in the study. Well, in this case, when it looked at the highest coffee consumers, they actually weren't that healthy. In fact, they had higher percentage of smokers. They really didn't move that much. They ate lots more red meat, ate fewer fruits and vegetables, and drank more alcohol. So all the things that they really shouldn't be doing, they were doing as coffee drinkers as well. So what does that tell you is you're already starting with a group that is sicker compared to the people who weren't drinking a lot of coffee. Let's keep that in mind as we look at the data. So let's start with the risk of dying from anything. What did the study find? First, men had a 12% lower risk of all-cause mortality for drinking the most amount of coffee versus the lowest amount. Women had a 7% lower risk. Now let's go into specifics. How many cups did that translate? Remember, the previous studies that I've talked to you about looked at about three to five cups being the sweet spot, right? Cups, not, you know, a brand name like Starbucks something, which would actually be their tall coffee is two cups. But this is looking at three cups per day or more versus none. What did they find? Men had a beautiful 18% reduction in the risk of dying from anything. Women had an 8% reduction in the risk of dying from anything. Now, the most important thing which I was so glad to hear repeated in this study from other studies is, once again, there's no difference between caffeinated or decaf. So all you lovers who are sensitive to caffeine, you can rejoice because guess what? Decaf is okay. Now, digestive diseases. This is anything from stomach to the intestines and so forth. What did they find? Men had 59% lower risk of digestive diseases. Women had 40% lower risk of digestive diseases. But what about the risk of death from liver disease specifically? Well, men and women had an 80% reduction in the risk of death from liver disease. And if you had cirrhosis, highest versus lowest consumption, men and women, 79% lower risk of mortality if you had cirrhosis. What about cancer? Was there any data for protective or hurtful? Well, if you drank a lot of coffee, what we found was there really wasn't any data in men. But surprisingly, now this is the only study that I've come across so far that showed that women had a 12% higher risk. When they broke it down, they found that the only place where the risk was, was specifically for ovarian cancer, no other cancer. Now this is interesting and odd because there's no other study that has been able to replicate that result. And even the authors in this study didn't understand why there was a higher risk, but something to note. Now, why is it that coffee may actually be protective on liver? Remember, we said there's such a beneficial effect to drinking coffee, especially with liver disease and with liver cirrhosis. So what's the possible mechanism? There's a few thoughts. First, Coffee is antifibrogenic, which means it really prevents scarring on liver cells, which is fantastic. And then it lowers cell growth. So remember, if cells get out of control and they start to divide really fast, that's cancer. So by lowering those cell growths, it can actually have a protective effect. And the bad cells, by stimulating apoptosis, which is cell death, it's basically helping the body to get rid of cells that may not be dividing the way they should, may be harmful to our body. This is our body's own mechanism, and it's potentially that caffeine may help to increase that. What about adhesion? It's basically cells sticking together, a bunch of them get together, they start to have a company, and they feel stronger, so they start to do bad things. So inhibiting adhesion, especially to cell walls and to each other, can be helpful, especially for a number of other diseases. Now, in mouse models specifically, what we find is that with coffee intake, there's less liver fat accumulation. The reason that matters is the more fat you get in the liver, the higher the risk of developing not only fatty liver, but scarring and eventually cirrhosis of the liver. 
And then oxidative stress, which basically causes cells to die early, creates all sorts of inflammation in the body. And if coffee actually decreases that, as seen as animal models, that can actually be very beneficial. Inflammation, it also decreases inflammation, which is great because the majority of diseases cause inflammation. All right. Before we jump up and down about coffee, we need to understand what were the limitations and what do we need to take home. So first, not all the centers collected data on decaf, decaf coffee. So if you're thinking decaf is equivalent, I can't say for sure. But based on all the previous studies, they are all consistent that decaf and caffeinated had no difference. So it's a pretty good um, estimate to say decaf and calf are pretty good and OK. Now, it's interesting that most people, including myself, consume both decaf and, and caffeinated. I drink a cup of coffee in the morning, but I'm very sensitive, so I only drink decaf after the morning coffee. So a lot of people are like that, and therefore, to be able to distinguish the two is very difficult. Also, one of my pet peeves in most studies is that assessments are only done at baseline, which means only in the beginning and never again. So that makes it very hard to be able to tell what's really going on. But in general, data have shown that if you get an assessment in the beginning, it is pretty good as far as coming up with an overall assessment. Now, ovarian cancer risk, this is odd because no other study was able to see this. And even here, the authors couldn't really explain why they would see this trend. So I'm not sure about this, and this kind of questions maybe was something else going on that caused that to happen. And then, of course, despite trying to adjust for everything, they can always be confounding. And this applies to every single study that I review for you guys. A couple more things. So EPIC, remember, EPIC is European, right? So if you're looking at other populations, it may not apply for different ethnic groups and so forth. But with coffee, we have lots of exciting data already. So we have data to show how it applies to general populations. Now, of course, self-administered questionnaires is always an issue because, like I said before, it's hard for me to remember what I ate yesterday. So people will try to answer the way they think the investigator wants the answer. Number two, they honestly don't remember some of the stuff that happened. And then the registry data, the problem with registry data is it's only as good as the information that's put in. So the question is, is did people really die of, let's say, liver disease when they might have died of something else and the person didn't know and they just marked liver disease. Now, always remember correlation, not causation. What does that mean? That means that we did not design this to be an experiment. We didn't have a variable in there and then looked at what did that variable do for the outcome. This is just following people and seeing is there an association. So it's kind of like I wear a blue shirt today, it rains outside, therefore I think that wearing a blue shirt causes the rain. That's not true. It was just a correlation. And then there can be reverse causation, which means that basically people who drink coffee don't necessarily have lower mortality. It's that the people who tend to have the lowest mortality tend to drink more coffee. So whenever you're dealing with these correlations, you want to be careful about just assuming causation. But all that aside, what is the bottom line? It's very simple. Study after study, including this one, shows that if you drink coffee, whether it's caffeinated or decaf, it does lower the risk of all-cause mortality. And based on this data, especially things like digestive mortality and liver mortality. And what's that optimal number of coffee? Well, about three to four cups a day. Now remember, this is not like those coffee cups sold not the eight ounces cup, it's a regular cup, which means an eight ounce would be about two cups of coffee. Alrighty. So as always, I want to thank everybody for watching this video. And please, please, please don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on selfprinciple.org at Facebook, at Twitter, my hashtag at Sean Hashmi MD. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.